why don't we um, kind of warm up today because these are nice conversation pieces. <laughs> there are actually two problems. You know, these techie guys, they don't allow me to project two screens with different things. So I had to squeeze two slides into one. Can you see the color coding? The bottom one is blue. Though so you'll find some paper, pencil, because we are actually going to spend a little bit of time here. Is that okay? I promise I won't put anybody on the spot. All right. Um, the top one, can you see the number line? And you need a zero, one, two, and can you see there a few points? Yep, A, B, C, D, F, six points. Those are numbers, we don't know what they are, but they, they kind of live there. Make sense? And your job, listen, the competition is on. Can you pick any two of those numbers and operate them, like add, subtract, multiply, divide them, just once, okay? Take two of them and then make them with an operation and try to come up with a big number. Is that okay? Try that. And give ourselves like a minute or two. How many of you, raise your hand, how many of you started with, oh, I'm gonna make it big by adding the biggest number? Raise your hand, please. Good. What about multiply? Even more powerful, right? You try that? Until your neighbors and everybody else said, you know, try something else. Make sense? So, um, can you raise your hand quickly if you think this problem is kind of fun? Raise your hand, please. Okay, majority. That's cool. Um, now, if you look at rigor, rigor has three components, right? So, would you call this one mostly computational? Or is it, what, come on, talk to your neighbors. What is this one, mostly? <laughs> Folks, <laughs> this table says there's conceptual component in it, definitely, in addition to computation. Do you all agree, everybody? Yeah. Yes? And I think we have some input from here. Okay, please, come on, it's okay. It's not about you. <laughs> Loud. Okay, talking to this one. The um, rigor, yeah. I, I think there's exceptional understanding necessary there. Mm -hmm. And my answer, so yeah. the product of A and B, it has to be greater than zero, so they could both be negative or they could both be positive. Good. Do we have these kind of problems in our textbooks? I would say no. Did you hear that, everybody? Is it a good problem? I think so, yes. Can our student do it? Absolutely. Did you hear that, everybody? In a way, we are kind of underestimating what our students can do. And we need material to excite them and entertain them. Right. Agree? Yes. And that kind of sets the tone for today's uh, hour and a half. So let's go. This is my best friend. It's been helping me through life. I've become a better person uh, thinking this way. Better husband, you know. A better teacher. So what is this? Yeah, it is an elephant, yes. But why is it drawn in such a weird way? There's an American version of it. It's known as Seven Blind Mice. How many? Yeah, some of you are nodding your head. Yeah. Uh, this story is trying to hint and remind us that we, you, me, Pete, everybody in this room, we are all partially blind in the sense that we grew up a certain way, we we're educated a certain way, we only know what we know. We don't even know what we don't know. And a lot of times, we don't even care about stuff that we don't know. <laughs> Make sense? So uh, in order to develop yourself into a better person, sometimes you really have to open up yeah, and try to listen to other people's opinion better. And look at this. Let's say I'm a mouse coming from behind. I said, well, an elephant is like a rope. And you said, no, 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 an elephant is like tree trunks. And you're duking over it. 
But in a way, we're both right, but both incomplete. Don't you agree? Yep. So the sooner you can come to this realization that your perception of the truth is incomplete, the sooner you come to that realization, the more probable you will be willing to listen to different opinions and try to understand their perspective. And eventually, you actually grow some knowledge. Is that OK? So Republicans don't hate uh, Democrats so much, and vice versa, please. Okay, they're not totally dumb. <laughs> All right, everybody? Yeah. Um, let me see. And sometimes, I would say it's not easy. It's easier said than done. How do you do that? On a regular day, we put blinders on ourselves. Yep. And the advent of technology does not help. As you know, on the internet, you read newspaper that's tailored for you. Sometimes you put filters on. So if you don't like sports, you don't see sports. Yes or no? So you end up being silent. And there's a book written about it about two years ago. It's called The Filter Bubble. We, more and more, we are growing into, we are living inside a bubble we create. You only get together with some block folks that you like, yeah? And the whole country, that's why we like Trump and uh, Sanders. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because we <laughs> hang out with the, the same kind of crowd and we get polarized. Yeah, and it's not healthy. So try to fight the urge and try to expand your mind that's what I'm attempting to do today. So um, please, can you all give me the license to say whatever I wanted to say? Is that OK? Yes. Don't sue me, OK? This is captured on tape. So. <laughs> all right, all right, let's go. And uh, in return, you have the license to ask any questions. Is that OK? Just raise your hand or just shout out. And we'll try to get there. All right? And we did this one, and we commented, they have, let's dissect the word, rigor. And by now, if you view rigor as a three-legged stool, can you hum it now? What are the three legs? Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, procedural fluency, which is computational fluency. Yep, makes sense, right? And we will revisit this uh, graphics later. Can you imagine teaching math with only two legs or one leg? What would happen? Yeah. Yeah, fall over. It's incomplete. OK, we'll come back to that. And since there are some high school folks here, um, so don't tune out on me. This one is kind of crazy. It's considered obscene. My partner, Dr. George Johnson, said, never show that obscene slide in public again. <laughs> Here I am showing it. Okay. This slide, uh, the fund is small, but uh, some of you do read Chinese, don't you? Raise your hand if you do a little bit. Yeah, some of us, yeah, thank you. Um, it is from Taiwan and uh, from a, like a police academy entrance exam. There are 24 problems. And it gets pro progressively harder. The first 20 questions is A, B, C, D, E, pick one. The last four is A, B, C, D, E, F, pick as many as possible or as needed. So it's a very uh, interesting test. Would you like to see number one? Okay, this is people who want to become a police officer. Number one, I'm going to make it bigger. There's a number, it's called Omega, but let's call it W. It has an ugly look. It has a negative part and it's a fraction. Worst of all, it has that eye thing dangling at the end. It's a complex number, right? Folks, even if you don't do that, come on, breathe. This whole construct is one number. Is that okay? Okay, our high school kids are trained to do this. Take that number and try to compute this. Can you see that? So it's kind of a square it and cube it and the fourth power, fifth power, and then add them all up all the way to the 24th power. And 
What the heck is this? Um, Terence, my friend, yesterday I begged you to engage your friend to solve it. Did you take a crack at it? Start did not finish, right? Um, high school folks, can you raise your hand? Just raise your hand, yeah. Um, would you like to comment on what you are looking at? Some of the, you know, super geeks are actually digging into it. That's that. Um, high school folks, if you are not digging into it, can you comment on this kind of problem? Huh? I know some of us are saying, what is this? Where are we going today? Relax, we're going to come back to K-8, okay? Just want to see. I call this an obscene slide, but it's a real data. I'm just going to show you some real data, okay, everybody? Why do we say it's obscene? Of course, you can square that thing. Just knowing i times i is negative one, you can actually tough it out. That, it would take like an hour, right? And being number one in a test, nope, you're not going to blow precious time on that. So here is the fresh look. Look at that number. It has two parts. The first part is like negative one half. The second part is like square root of three over two. And if you know trigonometry, you say, son of a gun, that's cosine and sine. And if you think it through, it's 120 degrees. So the number, it's actually a 120 degree rotation on the complex plane. So if one power is 120 degrees, two powers will be, come on, 240. Three power will be 360, back to square one. So that sucker you're looking at, it's the cube root of one. Make sense? And then once you see that, it will just clean up, and eventually the answer is very, very clean. Okay. So I'll say that again in Taiwan, a kid, is supposed to stare at this problem and solve it in their head. I'll say that one more time. We're expecting kids in Taiwan and Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore to solve this problem by inspection. To time, hence, tie behind the back. Is that okay? And you think I'm crazy. I'm telling you I'm not. This is a reality you need to deal with. Is that okay? You said, no, I don't like that. Then you're going to like the next slide. <laughs> next slide is made with, uh, I also engage um, leaders. So one morning we're doing math, math unit. I think some of us took my NISL. Raise your hand if you did my NISL. NISL means National Institute of School Leadership, right? And one morning, I think it was in Lawrence. Some of you are from Lawrence. And your superintendent, LaBoy, remember LaBoy, <laughs> was there. And everybody was freaking out because we needed to do math. So we said, well, let's you know, be gentle. How good are you with math? And we came up with a rating system, and it goes like this. Um, what is PG, everybody? Louder. Pretty good. Keep going. G? Good. M? Mediocre? OK, good. And R? No, they say, they said rusty, rusty, rusty. Okay. And what is VR? Yeah. And we kind of pour ourselves and put ourselves in the bins, and we were all laughing. I know it's very disarming. Can you see that? How many of you can see one person defected in front of everybody? <laughs> I didn't make it up. This is real data. And on that day, one person, luckily, I think that person said, can we also do it for ELA, like English? And look at this. Can you see that? About 68% said, almost 70% say they suck at math, all right? And ELA, it looks like that. Wow, and you said, wow, thank you. Because this kind of defines math education landscape in USA, everybody. Come on, you're nodding your head. You know what I'm talking about, right? A lot of parents and a lot of maybe teachers, when they are not specializing in math, they can propagate this American disease further down. 
Yeah, so John 1 needs to undo this, everybody. How do you undo this? That doesn't mean you have to lie. Say, oh, I'm very good at math. No. You just have to say, I'm not good at math with some positive connotation, like some remorse or saying something like, I wish I could have blah, 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 blah. Make sense? Please, uh, job one, forget about standards, okay? Fix the attitude. <laughs> There's a book, I think some of you know, it's written by Carol Dweck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're nodding your head. Carol Dweck. Uh, the book is called Mindset. And it might appear that it's like a head shrink talking about positive mindset, but it's proven in large-scale experiment that your beliefs about learning outcome can actually impact learning outcome. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you say, oh, I'm never good at that. I'm not a number person. And you wear it like a badge of honor, mm -hmm. then it will be true because it's called closed mindset. Make sense? So if you want, check out the book. It's pretty cool. Lots of examples, real life examples. Like in, um, she, she mentioned a particular way you can win, win over kids one at a time, including those gangsters and ring leaders. Does that make sense? If you, you have to kind of jump on, make them believe in themselves. They can make a debt, make them themselves grow smarter. That's called growth mindset. Okay, so I'll say that again. This double standard is unacceptable, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, so let's move on. All right. All right, today um, the official talk is called The Music is Not in the Guitar, and some of you already know what that means. Near the end, I hope we we'll have time to invoke Yoda and Morpheus. Yep, but no guarantee. And today's outline, I'll poke you, make sure you're awake, and then look at data. The reason for look at data is we need to recalibrate our expectation, including that obscene slide. It's real data, is that okay? It might not be acceptable to you today. I'm hoping 10 years from now, you will say, oh yeah, I didn't believe him then. But now, we are closer to that. All right, and can you see three, four, five? Those are about the standards and the nature of mathematics. All right, and after that, um, um, I'll try to set the record straight about what um, these material means. At this conference, you come here, you've got a lot of nutritious stuff, right? And we will um, try to realize what that really means. So let's go. Um, it looks very busy, and you have to squint to see the states. This is um, state reporting out. Remember um, Nickleby? It's called No Child Left Behind. Yeah? State has to report um, the percentage of their kids every year uh, that are proficient or advanced. And here you go. State report their own data. Different tests for every state, right? And who's, uh, yeah, who's on top? It says Georgia, 87% proficient or better. Do you believe that? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Where is uh, Florida? Can you see Florida somewhere? Mm -hmm. What about Massachusetts? Where is it? Massachusetts is kind of uh, right here, almost at the bottom of Massachusetts. Do you believe that? I don't. So luckily, some people took the same year, same group of, uh, same body of students, 2011 cohort. They use world standard tests. It's called TIMSS, T-I-M-S-S, -S, trends for um, international study, um, um, T-I-M, uh, math and science study, okay, TIMSS. And are you ready? Light blue bar coming up. The dark blue is the state result. Light blue is common ruler. What do you see? Yeah. Can you talk to your neighbors, please? What do you see? Did you hear that? Massachusetts did pretty well. 
in TIMS. It lead the pack, and it's even higher than our own state test. So there's something to say about Massachusetts. Let's look at Georgia. They claim 87%, but the actual data from TIMS is 24%. I'm sorry, you lied. <laughs> Georgia people. I'm sorry, it's nothing personal. This is just data. Uh, Massachusetts folks, can you raise your hand, please? Yeah, uh, there's a majority here. Uh, because we're, duh, we're in Boston. <laughs> but, so there's something people think we're doing right in Massachusetts. Listen, whenever I go to other states or go to a federal level meeting, people say, oh, you're from Massachusetts. And they were doing this, oh, we're not worthy. <laughs> As if we figure something out. Let me ask Linda. Linda, have we figured something out? Yes. Okay. We got to listen to you. All right, Linda. What? What? Why Massachusetts? Of all fifty states, why do we stick out as the poster child? Well, I think we're very enthusiastic about supporting students' mathematics learning. I think you're right, and um, Linda is heading the Boston effort. And just so you know, if we show a picture of all urban areas, like. DC, it's at the bottom, you know that, right? DC, uh, Detroit, New York City. Guess who is the poster child on that chart? Boston. All right, so there's something um, in Boston, and a lot of people would, would agree with you. And I think if you hunt them down, they would say, you know what? Jesus, we started early. We started in like 1993. Listen, this is before No Child Left Behind. Massachusetts, we started to learn to kick our own butts early, much earlier than everybody. Am so, I right, Mary? Absolutely, yeah. So Andrew, can I yeah. say one more thing? Yeah, please. We also have a spectacular pre-K math program mm. in many parts of the state. And that's where you can begin to close achievement gaps. Did you hear that? Those kind of head start effort? Where is my friend Audrey? Where are you? Audrey, raise your hand, please. Oh, I, I thought you were going to sit in the front. No? <laughs> Yeah, last night over at dinner, we were talking about this issue. So you are quite right. Everybody, it's very multifaceted. So uh, is that OK? Let's uh, go back to data. All right, let's go. So there's a ruler that USA use every two years. It's known as NAEP, N-A-E-P, National Assessment of uh, Educational Progress, N-A-E-P, every two years. And this is the most recent data. And Massachusetts people, you'll be very happy. Well, we lead the pack, and literally sticks out. Can you see that? So where's your state? Where's Georgia? Oh, I can see. Georgia is around here. Georgia. What about Florida? Where's Florida, everybody? Huh? And Rhode Island is like in the middle, right above the average, the color line. Okay, so okay, this is just average. <coughs> and average can be misleading because everybody, the demographics are different, everybody. Right? When you say, oh, Mississippi, you know what, go there. Then you will see what I mean. Yes? Go to Arkansas, you'll see what I mean. And uh, I'm not going there, but there's some recent effort trying to recalibrate this data. Please Google it, it's called breaking the curve. If you Google those words, you can find a report. So the chart looks a bit different. Massachusetts is still on top, but Louisiana kind of jumped to the mid because you really have to be fair about comparing things. That raw average is uh, a bit unfair, but it still tells the story. All right? So I was curious about um, DC. There was a general, re retired general, who resigned. On the press conference day, he told the press, I've been on battleground left and right, but throughout my career, this is the toughest battle, meaning in DC being the commissioner. So um, a lot of things in DC we'd like to be able to help, but it's um, 
it's a kind of a title. I think it's almost, almost, almost like a title of a book that's yet to be written. Okay, does that make sense? DC, look at the data there. There's something fundamental. Okay, and uh, that's a EDD thesis. So if you are interested, to go there, visit and, and analyze. Okay, and I'm going to take you abroad. This slide is very busy, and there's three columns. On the left, it's math. In the middle, it's ELA. On the right, it's science. And different countries got ranked, and they show some kind of distribution of different levels of performance with color bars. So, from where you are, you might not be able to see it, but the top ranking countries, right, uh, try to the top ranking countries in math, most of them are Asian. Yes? Do you think it's genetics or it is something else? I think it's something else. I grew up there, I know. It's, the game is totally different. Right. Um, I'm going to annotate this graph. Can you see where USA is? If you miss it in this chart, it shows up as the last one. But we are not the last. There are countries behind us. I just didn't have room for, for them. So is that okay? So anyway, we rank pretty low, over 30. Yeah. And it's very different feeling when you look at education. In Olympics, come on, USA, USA. We always get gold medals and everything, right? We got the most medals, most gold, among other things. But in education, math and science, and even ELA, language, we're not that hard. I'm sorry, this sounds like it's very polite, but I'm just a messenger, all right? So um, I asked myself, well, I come from there. It's called Taiwan, and the score is pretty high there across the board. South Korea is high, too. So um, Massachusetts, we are kind of, we pay extra to be graded as a country, and we ranked there, like Germany-ish, so not so bad. Right? And some of you are from Connecticut. I think we have data there. So not too bad. But all in all, USA is pretty low. And this test is different. It is done for 15 year olds and it's mostly um, real life context, almost foreign context. Like you don't know what they're going, what kind of curveball they're going to throw. So it's heavy duty um, word problem. Make sense? It's known as PISA, a European test. PISA stands for Program for International Student Assessment. Every three years we have some data. And this is the latest round. Superimposed on this graph allow me to show, I'm not kidding, I'm gonna show cell phone producers. Taiwan produces HTC. South Korea produces Korea, um, what? Samsung, the LG. Japan produces Sony, together with Sweden. I think Sweden produces Ericsson, Sony Ericsson. And Finland produces Nokia. And of course, we have iPhone, right? Agree? And there's a country that was there last summer. It's called Estonia. They produce Skype. Okay. How many of you do use Skype? It's Estonia, right? So it's a kind of a leveled playing field now. And who's ever, whose kids are sharper, smarter, they're going to win this game of money. The reason we're showing cell phones is because just look at the electronic stores. They're not selling that much of anything else now. It's all about cell phones. Every year or two years, you ditch your phone and get a new one. Yeah? Who is making the money? You think iPhone. Well, think again. I have a pie chart. <coughs> iPhones represent about 9% of the world market. What? Yeah. <laughs> and maybe part of it is because they're hiding their income overseas. <laughs> 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 wink, wink. <laughs> All right. But there's a graphics very telling. Uh, look at iPhones. They are like what, seven, eight hundred dollars each. Yes. You know what? 
for every dollar iPhone car charge, how much money flows back to the USA? Very little. Most of them is Germany, Japan, and China is for production. Is that okay? So it's, most money flows to Germany and Japan for patents and stuff and fabrication. All right, so what we're saying here is it's a bit dangerous to say it. Do you think they're correlated? Your kids score in this country's economic future? Yes or no? I think uh, if you use common sense, it sounds like there will be. And even if Apple, if you go to Apple's headquarter in California, in Cupertino, I think, you will see a lot of Asians working for Apple because we rely on imports. Imports meaning like you are looking at one, yeah, they're educated K-12 somewhere else, and we have a system to attract those top brands into this melting pot. Does that make sense? And good, we will keep that part going. But on the other hand, we are not going to be shying away from asking the question, how come they can produce kids that can think deeper thoughts than our system? Is that okay? All indication pointed to that. And therefore, duh, common core is born. <laughs> That's why we need standards. We need higher standards. Is that okay? This kind of a long version of what the heck are we doing? I mean, standards to come and go. Why are we doing another episode? Well, just breathe. Tough it out. It shall pass. <laughs> no, I think the main message is we have to learn from Massachusetts. Let's take our own butts a little. Is that okay? Yep. All right. And I'm not the only one to say it because Amanda Ripley, she traveled the world. She's curious about this phenomenon, so she um, got some funding to look into it and wrote a book about it. And some of you know it, right? About two years old now. And the title is a bit uh, disconcerting, but it's trying to shock you. And I took the liberty of condensing the whole book into one sentence. Can you take this seriously? I think I agree with her. All right. Remember that obscene slide? You think, no way my kids can do that. You know what? That is because we didn't give them enough training. We didn't expect enough. We didn't dare to demand from the get-go. Make sense? And I'm sorry, I, I might be kind of annoying you right now. But please, make a mental note. Can you give yourself 30 seconds and maybe take some journal, OK? Or mental journal? What is this guy trying to do to me? Capture your thinking right now. Now, um, I'm going to use another test, international test, and it's more like state tests. Very traditional questions, and the level is similar to um, our own. It's known as TIMS. I showed that earlier. So here it's an eighth grade problem, eighth grade problem. And if you look at it, it's not really eighth grade, it's actually fifth grade in our standard. But it's about retention. So, read the problem. What are they asking? They're not asking you for the answer. Can you think about it for like 30 seconds and then engage your neighbors, please? Thank you. Yeah, talk to your neighbors. Make sure you have some consensus. Will you be surprised? What do you think? Our eighth graders, what percentage will get it right? What percentage will get it right? Ta -da. Can you look at the data? Where is USA? Yeah? Right about what? 
28%? One in four kids can answer it correctly. You know what? It's like chimpanzees. Even if you hire a whole room of chimpanzees and ask them to do A, B, C, D, pick one, they will do 25%. Yeah, so we are slightly higher. Um, on the right, you can see those Asian countries, 80, 90%. That's kind of more like it. We want that. We don't have it. So if you look at the problem again, <coughs> listen, what leg is it hunting down in rigor? What are we looking at? Did they ask you to compute and give me the answer? Uh -uh. What are they asking? Yeah, longer. Understanding is the conceptual leg that they're hunting, right? So do you agree with me? In the USA, our education, in the regular classroom, we suffer from the following. We might um, kind of forget to build that leg, conceptual leg, it's not being built. Yeah? And you say, I don't have time. I barely have time to make my kids compute. You know what? Yeah. Yeah. I think you can fill in the blank. We need to make time for that. And I'll show you another phenomenon. This is a real phenomenon. Come on, look at this. This is about third to fourth grade. Wow, our kids can now multiply multi-digit number and even divide when the numbers are clean. Yes? And add the multi-digit. Cool. Now, we are going to expand their knowledge so they can deal with uglier number. Like, whoa, can you see that? Decimal. Yes? Nice. Now they can do decimal divisions, long division, which is a major milestone. But after that, look at this bullet. When you unleash this problem, What happens when you unleash this problem? I don't know. I don't know centimeter. How do you expect me to do it? Come on, fight back. How many of you agree a lot of our kids will refuse to do this problem? They will drop their pencil and say, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so, which leg is it now? No, we are doing the leg that is known as uh, computation fluency, monkey see, monkey do, I teach you how to divide decimals. You know what? That's incomplete. If you look at it from the lens of rigor, it's not enough. So common course score a good point by, a good solid point by putting together this rigor requirements. So let's try to respect it. This is called problem solving, yeah? If you can compute. Can you use computation to solve your problem? Make sense, everybody? So I'm not, make, not making this up. Uh, this one is really annoying. However, if you change it to uh, shopping, let me uh, try to change it to shopping. Uh, like, is that uh, slightly more doable? Yes or no? Slightly. And if it still looks intimidating, what about this next version? The three problems are the same, everybody. The bottom three problems are identical. It is just the numbers got ugly, er, uglier, and the scenario becomes a bit boring. And now you are chickening out on me. Does that make sense, everybody? So teachers trace back this uh, progression and try to train our kids so that they can actually function in boring context. Why? Because that's why we learn math, to be able to actually use it to solve problems some of the time, all right? So computation alone is not enough, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but um, it's so important, okay? Uh, 
there's a video, and I might not show, but um, I, I would uh, encourage you to download it. If I show it, it'll blow time. It's known as Photo Man. It's an app. You can download it, iPhone, Android, and the price is right. It's free. Okay? So what you do is um, teacher assign homework, and you take this cell phone, your cell phone, take a picture of the problem, and lo and behold, what happens? Yep, it knows how to deal with fractions, or it can solve the equation, solve for x. And if you want step by step, it will spit out. Okay, is that okay? Yeah. So, that kind of, it's hunting us down. So what are we teaching in mathematics? If calculators can do so much, so why are we doing, what are we really teaching everybody? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. If we are not careful in our classroom, we will be doing those uh, monkey see, monkey do things so that the kids can compute. Yes? So from their point of view, they will say, oh, I know math. Math is just like a random collection of rules that you memorize so you can get to the answer quick. And you know, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir because it's further it's very far from the truth. Math is a coherent piece. All the concepts build upon each other. It's called coherence. One thing leads to another, and they are glued together logically. Right? So we need to teach accordingly, pay respect to the coherence progression. Okay? And some of you might um, find the following interesting. See the three legs? Um, there's a sports analogy, and I, some of us love baseball. Raise your hand if you do love baseball. Okay, good. And baseball, um, let's say, if you're coaching a youth team, what skills do they have to have? Come on. Yeah, hitting, catching, throwing, running, and dissect each one. Hitting, there are different kinds of hitting. Yes, different stands, different swing, bunting, yes. Running bases, they have some uh, subtleties in more. Ditto throwing, they're different throws. Catching, gosh, fly ball, grounders, they're all different. But those are like computation fluency. Do you agree in sports? Those basic moves are computation fluency. Are they the baseball game? No. Did you hear that? It's very boring to just keep practicing the basics, but you do need to, right, everybody? So the analogy is pretty exact. In math, computation fluency is not enough, but we do need it. Okay, let me give you an example. My team, this kid, he can catch very well. I mean, he's so nimble, so I put him up as a short stop. So he's in a position. When the batter is up, he hunger down, and the ball comes his way. He caught the ball, and he looked back at me, and he said, Coach, where do I throw now? Come on, come on. Where do I throw? You throw to first base, or, or home, or second, or third, or, <laughs> Sometimes you do not throw. You fake a throw and you try to tag, tag the runner, yes? So I'm a short stop, I can catch, I can throw. But I have to know when and why I do certain things. And that is known as conceptual understanding of the game. Did you hear that? You have to know the rule and all the, the tricky situations so that you can pull out the right tool. Make sense? And now this kid, you have him watch a lot of uh, Major League Baseball games. So he knows the rule and he knows all the right thing to do. I'll say that again. This kid can catch and throw. This kid knows the concepts of baseball. Now this kid is perfect now. Yes or no? Uh -uh. What's missing? Yeah, you need the real game. You, every player needs to be baptized by real games. Yes or no? 
Yeah. So in the baseball analogy, can you see those three legs in action? Yes? Okay. So um, we're going to move forward. Um, the first thing I'd like to tell you is that even as simple as that problem, two fractions, you want to add them. What does it take to add two fractions? Principles, raise your hand, please. This one is for you, okay? Because math teachers know full well. What does it take to add two fractions when the denominator, the downstairs, are different? Ooh. Ooh. That's pretty messy. First of all, you need to know how to count a like kindergarten, yes? And then you have to know how to add like two to three or seven to eight, yes? Multi-digit 23 to 44, yeah? And once you do the whole numbers, you need to totally understand multiplication so that you know multiples. Let's do it. Three, six, nine, twelve, yeah? And these are basic moves like throwing and catching, right? And once you know multiplication, you can do division, right? Chopping, yes? And once you can chop, we're going to do some fancy chopping. We're going to take one. Can you see one? We're going to chop them into equal pieces. So each baby piece is known as a fraction. It's a unit fraction, like one third or one over 17, yes? And once you know those baby little pieces, one over 17, so what does three over 17 mean now? It's, yeah, it is three copies of this one over 17 stick together. Can you see that? This super slow motion is required so that when they see fraction, they don't freak out. And now, here's the problem. You know your fractions now, but how do you add fractions when the denominator, the downstairs are different? You can't. You can't add them. You have to pre-chop them into finer pieces so they are of equal sizes, then you can add them. So it takes a lot. Did you hear that? Adding fraction is fifth grade. But mathematics is so, I would say, it's ruthlessly cumulative, yes? So that um, you really need to pay attention to what's required. Everybody, now I want to engage of everyone that, um, how many of you know that there's a map for Common Core? Common Core actually has a map, at least from K to eight, right? You have seen it, right? And I'm going to um, attempt to show you the map. Uh, it's a, it's kind of weird looking. If you print it out, it's K to eight. It's like nine pages horizontally. And if you glue them together, it looks like a wall chart. And your standards are spelled out and connected in uh, this way. And later on, I think uh, you're, in your session, you get to see it in more detail. I'm going to just show you the uh, kind of the big picture. Can you see that? Yes? That's K to 8. K is on the left. Great 8 is on the right. Ooh, that looks freaky. But it's, uh, it's not that scary once you zoom into it. Let me attempt to um, I'll go there. Let me um, make it slightly bigger. Um, like that. Can you see that? It's like a wiring diagram. And this version is pretty cool. I did this version. If you mouse over it, it'll tell you what it is. This is kindergarten. KCC1, it's counting cardinality. What is it? Can you see that? It tells you what it is. It says count to 100 by ones and by tens. And it progresses. Everyone, it'll tell you what they are. Okay? And this graph is kind of interesting. Can you see the color coding? <coughs> Yellow one means what? And blue one means what? Remember the focus we talked about? Major cluster, support, supporting cluster, and uh, uh, additional clusters. And um, if you download this version, you'll see some of them are light blue, some of them are light green. It doesn't show up nicely here. But also you can see can you see this guy fires a lot of arrows into the future? Yes? Yes or no? And what does that mean? That guy fires arrows into the future. 
What does that mean? Huh? Yes. Louder, please. When they fire a lot of arrows into the future, that means that standard is very, yeah, louder. Yeah, very foundational. All right? And what about this guy? Can you see? Uh, I'm going to use my laser. Um, this guy, can you see? This guy on, on the right screen, this guy. Can you see it has a lot of arrows from the past? Right? And what does that mean? When you got a lot of arrows on your back, what does it mean? What does it tell you? I think you know what it is. When you have a standard that has a lot of arrows on its back, come on, say it. it There's a lot of pre to the other. There's a lot of pre rec to that one. A lot of prior knowledge is required. So that to teach that particular one well, you probably need to hunt down, backtrack. You know what I'm saying, everybody? Backtrack on this graph. Does that make sense, everybody? Backtracking? Yeah. So this graph, I hope, I think in the next hour or so, you'll get to see it again in more detail. I'm just advertising it. Is that okay? All right. And let's go back to the slide. So I'll just show you a few grades. And I admit to you, I, I work with a lot of teachers, and this is the most common questions um, that I needed to answer. My kids are not prepared. I'm teaching grade uh, seven, eight, or whatever. They're not ready for what I'm about to, to do. So my quick answer is, you're not going to like it. I said, train yourself to be self-contained. What? I'm saying if you teach grade seven, you actually need to know grades K to seven. Some of you are nodding your head. Some of you are not nodding yet. <laughs> what am I talking about, everybody? This is, do you agree this beast, known as mathematics, it has an inherent structure, yeah? It has a backbone, it has a progression, and it progresses coherently. So if you claim you want to be a good teacher, you actually need to know that progression. Well, high school folks, if you don't know how to teach fraction addition, you know what, you are handicapped. All right, I mean, I know it's not in your contract, but you are handicapped. You have a miserable life to live. <laughs> So what I'm saying is, how do you keep yourself sane day to day, given the fact that our students are not perfect when they walk into your room? You need to train yourself to actually peek into lower grades and sometimes even higher grades so you can uh, engage uh, kids at different levels. So I want to postulate a theory. Please agree with me. And I hope by the end of the, today, you would say, wow, this is real. I really have to do it. Um, when you claim you're teaching grade N, you're actually teaching grades K to N. So you need help with your peers at lower grades and higher grades. And second bullet says, actually, take that back. It should be N plus two, <laughs> ideally. Look at me. How much math do I know? I actually know kindergarten math. Is that okay? And I, it, I want to um, beg you to use me as a model. This guy knows a lot, but he's still trying to understand what is the pain of teaching third grade. What is your problem? How come you just added two goddamn fractions? What's your problem? You know, no, it doesn't work that way, everybody. And I define, if you trust me, um, in the future, I hope you will understand this better. A happy teacher is a teacher who knows the coherent progression of content all the way up to what you're teaching and beyond. Because, I know, you can compute, you can solve problems, that's not enough. Look at me. The, re, the, the sheer fact that you know how to compute, you can solve all the problems in the textbook, it's not enough. You can be a good student, but you are not a good teacher yet. 
To be a good teacher, you need to see how things connect. And you're going to make those connections explicit for the students so that they will have a desire to want to um, retain stuff. They will think, they will know it's useful, like a baseball game. If you don't let them play games, if you don't treat them with hard situations, how do they do double, double play? Yes? They say, oh, jeez, I love that double play, but I'm not good at it. I need to practice. Does that make sense? So all these are connected together. And I'll skip this one because this, the standard is so beautifully written. I just want to give the punchline away. Next time when you read the standard, uh, what, how did Kate say it? RTFS? <laughs> Some of you missed that. RTFS. Come on, that F is the F word. <laughs> um, see that thing I turn yellow? It's called it extending. Okay, Extending meaning if you search our standard, it happens about 34 times from K to 8. They're connected! So whenever you're teaching, when it says extending, you say, what? Extending what? Yeah, go back and, and try to make sense out of what they're saying. They say applying and extending. 34 times, and in high school, 10 more times. I'll say that again. When you read the standard, that extending or that extend word is the trigger word for teachers to say, oh gosh, this is connected to something prior to this. And let me try to kind of make the connection so clear so my kids will know, oh, this is not hard. This is like something I used to know. I'm just extending it. Is that okay? That's called coherence. Right? And we owe it to ourselves. To do it. So I'm not going to go into details. So can you take some, um, it's called a quiz, but actually I'm asking you to take some mental notes. What the heck is coherence? Come on, in your own language, you already know it, right? What is coherence? And the second question is, how do I take advantage of it? You know what? If you teach history, you don't have this on your back. If you teach math, you can leverage this coherence. It's your best friend, because math is totally connected logically. So if you can figure out that backbone structure, log logical progression, you rock as a teacher. Does that make sense? So if you just read your own standard, your own grade alone, you are gonna suffer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, so what the heck is SMP? I I think we're not going to go there. Standards of mathematical practice. Do you love it? Yes or no? Yeah, we all do. And rigor. Um, but you know what? It takes time. How do I pull it off in my classroom? So I just want to embed some C over there. And I'm going to skip quite a few because um, I was told instead of ending at 10, I need to end a little bit early so you guys can walk to your next room. Is that okay? So these are module examples. I'm going to skip. I'm going to um, share with you the second question that I got asked the most. It is, how do I make my students uh, do math practice? I mean, I don't have time. I barely have time to do computation. Yeah, the monkey see, monkey do part. You know what? It's like baseball. Come on, think baseball. How would you entice your kids to want to practice basic skills? Do you use games to expose your own weak points? Agree? Yes? When you are uh, playing a game, you lost, and you say, oh gosh, <laughs> that fly ball, I could have caught it, but Jesus, that was critical error. Okay, so what do I do now? I need to practice. Make sense? It'll make those two other components. Oh, I didn't know the rule well enough. This thing called infield fly. What the heck is infield fly? Never heard of it. Well, you know, now you do. You pay the price. So you get smarter every day, okay? Does that make sense? Those three legs, when you forgot about it, think baseball or think your favorite sports, all right? So in a way, how do you make kids fall in love with mathematics? It's the same question. How do you make the kids fall in love with baseball? You need to play real games, yes or no? Yeah? And in math, what are real games? These are problems with teeth. Those are problems that are rigorous. Yeah? Require kids to think. 
and struggle. Okay. And so my answer is, uh, maybe you want to make time so you can play games. Games, I think, demanding math problems in this context. Is that okay? And it sounds like crazy. Well, my kids cannot even do computation. You want me to torture them? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because once they got tortured, they say, oh, son of God, I didn't even know how to, how to add fractions. I need to do that so that I can play this game. Does that make sense so far, everybody? And it might be a bit um, cramped. I'll try to, um, uh, I think we don't have time for the problems I wanted to do. So um, I just want to share one thing. That this thing known as, known as SMP, it's very attractive. Come on, look at these eight bullets. They're so lovable, yeah? We all love them. Especially my principal said, make sure you do all those things. You know what? I want to uh, offer a word of uh, caution. It's very easy to get PD on this. And it's very easy to say, oh, well, I do that all the time. But um, I'm going to show you some graphics, and you tell me what that means. You know the story, right, everybody? It's what, Alice in Wonderland? showing this slide. Can you talk to your neighbor about it, please? And then I'm going to um, invite some of you to speak up. We love SMP, but there's a big but. Okay. solve problems. What did it say? It says it in a very weird way. It says solve. Yeah, real world is only half of it. And yeah, that part is a lot of people didn't see that one. I just want to make it clear. And this appears 36 times in our standard. Every time they said it, they said it in this weird way because we need to pay attention to it. Problem solving is, is not just solving real world problems. We are entitled to solve mathematical problems that are kind of naked mathematics with no stories, no context. Come on, agree with me? Yes, thank you. All right, and there are a lot of other things. <laughs> um, uh, maybe we can meet and talk about those in the future. Um, uh, high school folks. Uh, I have a question for you. How do you, why do we separate 
functions and algebra. And number 10, how do we teach geometry starting with transformations? This is weird. It's different from what I used to teach. Am I right? You need to be very careful when you venture into these grounds. And this is a wide audience. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. But high school folks, raise your hand if you agree with what I just said. Can you raise your hand? That you need to be very careful when you tread these waters. OK? And um, I hope we can go through those lessons. Um, sorry, this is Neil. He's learning to fight. <laughs> this one, Matrix. And Morpheus on the left, he yelled at Neil. He said, Yeah, what is he talking about? Okay? So register that as one bullet. And then uh, if you look at uh, Empire Strike Back, at some point, he couldn't get it, the machine up. So Yoda said, do it, you can do it. And he said, all right, I'll give it a try. And Yoda said, <laughs> Yoda's speech is weird. <laughs> Does that make sense? And some of us already know this by heart. Raise your hand if you already know the, all these things. Some of us, half of us, all right. Geeks, all right. Nice. <laughs> um, and in USA, we have this character who said, uh, you know who that is, right? Uh, okay, um, let's get a bit serious. Um, eventually, Yoda um, kind of lifted the X Wing fighter from the dump, from the swamp. And young Luke said, I can't believe it. And Yoda said, that is why you fail. I mean, if you watch the movie uh, uh, casually, you will miss all these things. These are pretty Asian stuff. It's so un-American. Because in sports, we always say, a nice try. You applaud. But in Asia, there's no nice try. <laughs> <laughs> so Yoda said, Again, this is serious. Everybody, this is coming to the good part. And you said, no, try not. <laughs> and what am I talking about? Can you see the text underneath? That is the big message. Is that okay? That's a kind of Yoda talk. And and how do I do that? Well, there's a lot of tools. You're about to see that in the next hour, okay? Those maps that will help you see the progression, all right? Does that make sense? Progression, coherence, matters, all right? And learn with and through others. It's called I don't have time to torture my students. And Yoda said, you must. But I don't have time. And Yoda said, that is why you fail. And Yeah, and it sounds like slogan, but it's actually true, everybody. Okay? And I have, you know, you know this already by now. How do you torture kids? Duh, you know, use interesting problems. And here you're getting a lot of material from um, these smart people from um, uh, Unbound ED. They're giving you all the goodies. Engage NY, illustrative math, all right? So trust them. But then you need to use some Zen master thing. Try to listen more to the students. And, all right? And it's torture, rigor. And well, this is to prove to you, Yoda exists. This is a 14th century manuscript. It really, I didn't make that up. You can Google it. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to skip this section altogether. But basically, it says, yeah. Um, Listen, the music is not in the guitar. You know what I'm talking about. Come on. Yeah? Um, I was showing Willie Nelson. His guitar was broken. It sucks, but he plays good music. Okay. And then if you like uh, Pink Floyd, and they basically said, if you give a, a Moog, a synthesizer to anybody, are they going to play good music like us? Or if you give a guitar, a good one to a chimpanzee, they're going to turn into Eric Clapton. Huh? No. No. Okay, so it's not in the instruments. 
So I'll say that again. Standards are like, uh, in music, it's like the score, the script, the piece we try to play. Yes? And the material you have, well, the things you're collecting, you're happy about them, online or printed. These are guitars. And we said the music is not in the guitar because you need to um, take them out and run them and test them. Is that okay? The magic, it's not in the material. Is that okay? So I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of a party pooper. You're getting good stuff, and I'm telling you, that's not enough. You have to pay up in your own time, investment of time. And tune out of the rest. I mean, the assessment and evaluation, those are not going to improve your game. Your game is the first three. Okay, so I'm going to be provocative. I said, even if you have perfect standards, perfect instruction material, perfect test, and perfect system, let's turn them all perfect. Then that's going to solve our problem now? Please say no. Of course not. The magic is in the middle part. The middle part is you. You have to go home and use this nice guitar you acquire, grow yourself, see the connections, see the coherent progression, and um, learn how to teach it. Be humble. Is that okay? Uh, so I'm not going to go through that. And be humble and be analytical. You guys are smart. And have high expectation. And by stay saying, we said, do it, OK? And here is my um, ultimate challenge for you. This challenge is, I'm going to take all the material away from you. Projectors, I'm going to take away your PowerPoint, take away all your textbooks, take away your markers. Take away your whiteboard, easel pad. You have nothing. Oh, you only have stick and sand. Ah, can you teach math now? Can you entertain that idea? That's where we need to be, everybody. High standard for you, all right? Can you teach with stick and sand? And armed with that notion, go, please go back, grow yourself with this nice guitar you just got. OK, thank you. Thank you.